welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode four of the Madden America podcast. Thank you so much for your feedback on both recent episodes, firstly with Dr. Mohanna and secondly the special episode we released for World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. If you want to discuss the episodes, you can now visit maddenamerica.com forward slash forums. This week we have an interview with Will Hall. Will is a mental health advocate, counsellor, writer and teacher. Will advocates the recovery approach to mental illness and is recognised internationally as an innovator in the treatment and social response to psychosis. In 2001, he co-founded the Freedom Centre and from 2004 to 2009 was a coordinator for the Icarus Project. In 2012, he presented to the American Psychiatric Association's Institute on Psychiatric Services. As an author, Will has written extensively on mental health, social justice, and environmental issues. He is well known for the excellent Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Medications, which is one of the first places that listeners should look to for help and support when considering taking or withdrawing from psychiatric medications. Will's latest book is Outside Mental Health, Voices and Visions of Madness. Released in 2016, it presents interviews with more than 60 psychiatric patients, scientists, journalists, doctors, activists, and artists to create a vital new conversation about empowering the human spirit. Outside Mental Health invites us to rethink what we know about bipolar, psychosis, schizophrenia, depression, medications, and mental illness in society. Will hosts Madness Radio, which broadcasts on FM and is also available as a podcast. For listeners, I recommend that you listen in and subscribe to the Madness Radio podcast, particularly as the harm reduction guide to coming off psychiatric medications can be heard in full. I was keen to ask Will about the harm reduction approach to helping and supporting people with their mental health, and also how an alternative, less medicalized approach to mental health and well-being might work and bring benefit to many. Will, thank you so much for talking with me today. Firstly, for the listeners, could you give us a little bit about your background and how you came to be interested in psychiatric drugs and mental health care? Well, I really got uh, drafted into this uh, this area of work and involvement. Um, I was uh, uh, living in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I ended up in the psychiatric uh, system. I went down to a very, very deep, bad state of my period of my life, a psychotic state that was called, and Ended up getting a, a schizophrenia diagnosis, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia diagnosis in the psychiatric system, and saw a lot of different things um, happen to other people around medications, as well as trying all kinds of different medications. Myself, antipsychotics, uh, so-called mood stabilizers, antidepressants, um, anti-anxiety drugs. I was on lithium for a while, and none of that helped me. The psych system really just made things worse. And it was really, I guess, about five or six years before I started to be involved with the uh, psychiatric survivor movement, Um, actually about eight or nine years. I met other people who had also been patients in the system who were figuring out for ourselves how to move forward. And that's what turned the corner for me. I started to really take charge of my own change and recovery and healing. And part of that, I was involved in starting a group called the Freedom Center in Western Massachusetts. And we ran support groups and people would come to the groups looking for information about withdrawal, including antidepressant withdrawal. And they were not getting anything from the mainstream system at all. This was the very early days of the internet. So it was also very limited what was available on the internet. And so we um, started to learn things for ourselves. And out of that, Uh, came a guide that I wrote, the Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Drugs. It's a free guide that basically distills all the knowledge and the learning that we gained from that uh, support group work, both with Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. And the guide has become very, very popular. It's translated into 14 different languages. There have been many thousands of, of downloads. And out of that, I started doing my own counseling work. And now I do counseling and and training and a lot of educational work around around medications, antidepressant withdrawal definitely, and also the antipsychotics and the lithium and mood stabilizers, all the different drugs that are used to treat mental health conditions. Thank you. That's incredible. To take your experiences and use them for the benefit of others is very powerful. 
Well, I wanted to ask you about the harm reduction guide to coming off psychiatric drugs, because it's arguably the definitive resource for people who do want to make changes with their psychiatric medications. What struck me about it is that the debate around psychiatric medication can be polarising, but the harm reduction guide strikes a really careful, non-judgmental balance, and I wondered if this was difficult to achieve. Um, It was. Uh, In writing the guide, I involved more than 50 different collaborators. I got all kinds of input from all kinds of different people. And there would be days in my email inbox where people would be sending me one message saying that the latest draft was two anti-meds. And another email, someone would be sending me a message saying that the latest draft was two pro-meds. So I figured I was on the right track if I was getting both sides of the of the bait, I'm unhappy with what I was coming up with. And really the reason that I took this view of not being anti-drugs or pro-drugs um, is just because of people's experience. I mean, when we talk with people, some people are, are you know happy with their medications and that's what they want to do, and some people aren't. And so it wouldn't be honest for me uh, to take a stance trying to tell people what they should do with their lives if that's not what is working for them, and this is really the the essence of what we call a harm reduction approach, as a as opposed to an abstinence or a absolutist um, approach. Um, harm reduction just means instead of telling people, you know, you have to stop alcohol or you have to stop injection drugs or you have to stop um, cigarettes until we're going to give you services or until we're going to let you into the program. It's more that we're going to meet you where you're at. If you're at a place where this is something that you're doing and you're continuing to do. We're not going to meet you with judgment. We're going to work with you and try and figure out for you what are ways to move forward. And I think that because the guide um, very carefully did not take a judgmental approach, and that's not the approach that I take, I think that we reached a lot more people. I think people are much more open. No one wants to go to someone around healthcare issues and feel like the person has an agenda, or they've got an axe to grind, or they're trying to push something on you politically, what you want is an attitude of openness and curiosity. What do these experiences mean to you? You know, if the medication is something that's not working, then okay, let's talk about making changes or looking at why or looking at what's going on. If it's something that you feel is working for you, then there's no reason to be judgmental or, or condemn the person. So I always, I always think in terms of the research, there's a lot of research out there. And I think we need to be very clear that the research does not support the idea that antidepressants are treating some disease of depression. The research does not support that these drugs are very effective. In fact, there's a lot of research out there that shows that they're not effective at all. But those are aggregates. Those are categories. You're working with many, many large numbers of people. I always work with N equals one. I always work with one person, the person who's right in front of me. And so, you know, the person's experience is most important. And I think that that creates a doorway that a lot of people who wouldn't be interested in thinking about medications critically, they will be because they know the conversation isn't going to be pushed by some kind of absolutist either or black and white thinking. Thank you, Will. That's so refreshing for someone in my position to hear because for people like me, there really was only one option for treatment. It was very much a case of you have a chemical imbalance and you'll need to take this drug for the rest of your life. To know that there are more holistic options that will consider what's happened in a person's life, that makes me very happy. Oh, great. Well, that's, um, that's the key thing, is that we have to both break down the myths, because this idea that people have a chemical imbalance, and that's what causes um, the disease of depression, is a myth that's been pushed by marketing, and it's also been widely recognized by psychiatry and psychiatric researchers and med- medical researchers. If you look at the fine print, they'll say, well, yes, we actually haven't found a chemical imbalance. No, there's no way to do a test for depression. Does that mean that, you know, different kinds of holistic or integrative healthcare approaches, nutrition or exercise, you know, that do change brain chemistry? Does that mean that those won't help someone? Well, they might or they might not. It depends, but they're definitely not treating or working with some kind of disease entity called um called depression so that's you know that was a very hard challenge how do you both break down the belief systems that are being promoted by pharmaceutical marketing and propaganda and at the same time not take a strong judgmental view because if someone says well look this medication it changed my life it helps me get through graduate school it helps me 
uh, you know, be a good parent with my children. This is what helps me. I don't care what the research says. You can't really fight someone based around their personal experience. What you can do is you can talk to them and get them, get to know them and relate to them and listen to them. And then there might be some process of exploration and discovery that they might think, well, actually, you know, maybe there are some alternatives here. Maybe there's things that I haven't tried. Maybe I should look beyond the message that I've gotten, uh, doctor. There's so much fear around this issue. I mean, when we're talking about depression. We're talking about an extremely frightening experience that can just destroy someone's life. It can just stop you dead in your tracks. It can make you not want to live. People kill themselves. People have lost people to depression. So it's a very, very frightening thing that we're talking about. And coming in with the kind of overconfident judgment about you should do this or you should do that, or we've got these answers for you, or we're going to you know, tell you this explanation for what's going on. I think it just, it just adds to the defensiveness and fear around the issues. So I think the, um, the success of the harm reduction guide, and I think one of the reasons that you know, I've become um, someone who sought after as a counselor around this issue is because people know that they're not going to get that kind of fear-based judgmental approach. Well, that comes across very strongly in the guide. It leaves plenty of room for individual interpretation, but it still gives people the information they need. This is the kind of approach that people want, isn't it? Rather than be told this is the only way. Yeah, to, to, get, the, to get the information that they need and also to know about the risks, because these are very, these are very dangerous drugs. You're on antidepressants long term. You can wreck your sexuality. You can have all kinds of cognitive problems. You can create memory um, issues for yourself. They can be very, very dangerous and very damaging. And people are not told that those risks are there. When I was put on Prozac, I had a, a manic reaction and ended up losing my job. And nobody, the prescriber and the therapist, none of them told me that that was one of the dangers of, of Prozac. No one was monitoring that when that happened. And in my counseling work, I see this over and over again, that people go to their doctor saying, I'm having this effect or I'm having this side effect. Could it be related to the, doc to the medication? And the doctor says, no, 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 that's not, that's not happening. And so we really need to get out of this um, view that sees these drugs, you know, as some kind of, you know, benign, you know, risk-free treatments for different diseases, but we have to see them as, as quite risky and that can cause huge problems, including the dependency and addiction, really, that makes them very, very hard to come off of. Thank you, Will. I did want to ask you now about dependence and withdrawal. In my own experience and the experiences of many that I've interviewed, there is a real unwillingness by the medical profession to accept that withdrawal difficulties are real, and the general advice is still stop your medication within a week or so. I just wondered what your view was in terms of what we need to do to influence medical science to accept that withdrawal and dependence are issues that need to be addressed. Um, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that needs to happen is that more people who have been on these medications and had difficult withdrawal experiences need to be sharing their stories and their experience. And the internet is a great tool for that. But also we need to go to writing letters to the editor, to calling in on radio um, shows to using Twitter accounts for feedback on on television and the news. We need to start to really get the word out that this is real and it's happening. And I think that that is starting to create some pressure on the medical profession. Um, and there's also research that's going on. If you start to look over the past five years, there's a lot more that's coming out, a lot more um, interest in withdrawal and dependency and withdrawal effects. But I think the main thing that we need to do is not wait for the medical establishment to change. We need to start taking this into our own hands, and we need to start supporting each other and sharing the information that we have and realize that you know it's not about waiting until you get a good doctor or searching around for the psychiatrist who's going to help you come off. You have to take charge of your own care. You have to be a collaborative, proactive consumer in um, medical care. And you have to very much be participating in your own destiny around this, because I think that the passivity and the dependence on doctors contributes to the dependence on the medications. And that's the piece where I see this as a liberation struggle that you know, th historically people with psychiatric diagnoses have been terribly disempowered, tortured, enslaved, put into um, asylums and 
killed and left to die in warehouses. There's an incredible history of homophobia and sexism and racism in psychiatry, and that continues in much more sophisticated ways, but it still continues. And so it's very important for us to see this about taking health into our own hands. We know today that when someone goes to the doctor for a medical condition and they get a diagnosis and they get a, um, a recommendation for surgery, the first thing they do when they come home is they consult Dr. Google. And they realize they, that, hey, there's actually more than one perspective on this, that medical science is, you know, the human body is a, is a mystery in a lot of ways. And medical science has limitations and different doctors will tell you different things. The hospital that's really good with surgery will recommend surgery. The hospital that's being much more good with uh, physical therapy and, and rehabilitation will recommend physical therapy and rehabilitation. And so people need to take things into their own hands and become empowered in making their own decisions, which I think includes looking at holistic alternatives, especially when we're looking at depression. I mean, you have to look at nutrition. You have to look at exercise. You have to look at relationships and meaning in a person's life, even if the research or the medical professional profession hasn't caught up with that. We really need to be proactive and see our health as about taking charge of our lives. I completely agree. Thank you. Also, I wondered, in an ideal world, Will, if you could create mental health care that you think would be more effective than the current medicalization of distress, what would that look like? Right. Well, I mean, in an ideal world, I, I don't think there would be mental health treatment. I think that we have to recognize that we're, we're putting human problems um, into a medical box. We're just making a huge category mistake. And so all the different things that you know, work in a medical context, like coming up with a quick diagnosis, putting all of the expertise into the hands of the specialist. I mean, I certainly don't know how to set a bone or do surgery. I mean, I certainly want expertise to be in the hands of the experts in a medical context. And then we put that into a mental health framework where, you know, no one is an expert on what the meaning of life is or what will make you a successful person or what will make you someone who, um, feels good about your relationships or feels inspired by your life or will find what your vocation is or will help you to, these are human problems. And so what I think we need more than anything else is a community response and a social response that's outside of the medical, medical framework entirely. I think that these are conversations that we need to have socially. Why are people depressed? What is it that is driving people's experience of getting depression. Well, it could be re related to the fact that we have a, a terrible agricultural and food system that's promoting poisonous food for everyone. We live sedentary lifestyles that were overworked, that we're in a, a world which is tumbling down into greater and greater ecological chaos, which is terrifying people, especially young people who are wondering what world they've been born into. And the way in which different oppressions and social injustice feed into this sense of disempowerment and being out of control and not having a sense of agency in our lives. I think that's the conversation that we should have. How do we create healthy communities that promote listening and caring for each other and connecting with each other? Depression is so connected with loneliness and isolation and separation. These are social problems, not medical problems. So I would like to see the entire conversation go outside mental health and go into a um, social and um, economic and political conversation about what kinds of societies we want to create, a community conversation. Thank you. That's a great destination to aim for. And I'm really pleased that you and your peers are pushing hard for the paradigm shift that's clearly needed. I also wanted to ask you if you had any general advice for someone who's thinking of withdrawing from or stopping an antidepressant. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question. I mean, one thing I would recommend is taking a look at the guide that I wrote, the Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Drugs, because I get asked that question a lot, and so I, you know, decided that it would be good to have something to hand people, a guide that can get into it, into the question more deeply, because there isn't a single soundbite or snapshot or recipe answer. What I would recommend to people is I would say, first of all, think about and explore what kinds of support do you have? Are you surrounded by people who are very strongly in favor of you taking the medication? Are they against you 
reducing or coming off? Or on the other hand, are you surrounded by people who don't seem to understand why you got on the medication to begin with and who don't have any space for listening to why the medication might have been useful to you? What kind of support do you have? Who are the people around you who are involved with this? And then I would look at, you know, what is it that you might want to replace the medication with? Or what is it that you might be doing instead of the medication as a response to the distress or the problem that got you on the medication to begin with? There was something real that is happening. That's why people take these medications, because there is real suffering. So what is it that you can do? How can you prepare yourself? What is it that you can put into place before you start coming off the medication? And then I would also recommend that people get some kind of, of support or some kind of connection around the emotional suffering that led to whatever they're calling depression or whatever their experience was, because often there are unacknowledged and unexpressed emotions that are driving depression. And even the word depression, I don't, it's not very useful in my mind because there's so many different kinds of depression. There's a depression where you're just tired all the time. There's a depression where you feel numb all the time. There's a depression where you are worrying and hating yourself with internal dialogue. There's a depression where you're grieving and sad. There's an anxious kind of gridlock, sort of like you're in a traffic jam kind of feeling. Depression. Everyone has a different experience of that thing that we call depression. So having a place where you can go and you can explore it and you can start to understand that there is maybe emotions there that need to be addressed, I think is very, very important. And then I think it's it's important to recognize that you know the information that people have gotten is usually not good information. So you want to have um, an opportunity to find out more, get on the internet, try and connect with other people who've come off their antidepressants, try and get exposed to a range of different experiences because some people have had a relatively easier time coming off. Some people have had a very, very difficult time. Some of the antidepressants, you know, especially Paxil, you want to be especially cautious about. You want to watch out for going too fast. But at the same time, I don't think you can make a cookie cutter recipe for everyone. If you're having intolerable side effects, then you have to make that difficult calculation of how much you want to stay on the med, how much you want to come off more rapidly. Or those kinds of questions can't really be answered by any expert. You're going to have to sort of sort that out for yourself. And then as a general rule of thumb, we do say, you know, go slowly, start out with a small reduction and then, you know, prepare yourself for possible withdrawal effects. They may not be, you know, what you've read about or what you've heard about. They may be worse. I mean, you, you could have all kinds of different things that are happening. And more than anything else, I would recommend that people stop thinking in terms of a chemical and their brain. This is really the big fallacy of psychiatry is that we have the brain causes human experience. And this is also the fallacy of, I think, the pharmacological way of viewing things that the chemical and the brain cause experience. No, your life causes experience. All the different things that you go through contribute to mind and contribute to who you are as a person. And so withdrawing from any drug that you're taking is going to be a life change process. Don't think of it as tinkering with the machinery and the chemicals of your brain, but think of it as embarking on a journey of change in your whole life. Making friendships may be just as important as the rate of your dosage reduction. Changing the food that you eat may be just as important as getting involved in a religious practice or being involved in school or getting something that motivates you and gets you connected with other people. So think about it in terms of a life change process, not a chemical manipulation of the neurochemistry of, of your brain, because that's really not what's going on. Psychiatry can make no claim to have answered the question of the mind-body dualism problem. They, how emotions emerge, how our consciousness comes into being, what depression is or what these feelings are. There's a huge tendency to reduce them to biological <laughs> mechanisms, but there's no, there are no answers. There's a, a hypotheses out there, but we live in an era of neurobiological absurdity where the human experience is reduced to brain firings of neurons. And there's no answer to the mind-body problem. That has been a, a challenge that philosophers and theologians and thinkers have faced for many, many centuries. And psychiatry doesn't have an answer to that. So I really encourage people to be more open-minded about what is going on in their experience. And think about antidepressant withdrawal or withdrawal from any drug as a life change process. I think one of the biggest challenges that people face in any kind of withdrawal process is, is fear. 
is fear that you're stepping into the unknown you're doing something new you're embarking on a process of change and there's going to be fear in that process and that's okay it's really okay to not have all the answers or be able to have everything certain before you start that fear is a natural part of any change and growth and learning process and to really do the what you can to not be alone with that fear to have other people supporting you and if you are someone who needs to be um, on your own in this process because i have seen people do that successfully on their own because they don't have that context of support to cultivate something inside of yourself some resource inside of yourself that's going to help you deal with that fear whether it's a spiritual practice or a commitment to a goal or a commitment to your family or something that keeps you motivated in terms of meaning in your life something that's going to carry you through that fear because that's what i see that people need help with most of all it's not necessarily having answers about dosage or having answers about what process to go through in terms of planning tapering it's really being able to be with and work with the fear that comes up and to move through it and to be willing to embrace the changes that are going to come as part of this process as best that you can. Thank you. That's great advice. And I can really relate to that personally right now, because if I'm completely honest, the fear of withdrawal effects is why I'm still on my antidepressant. It's not because it benefits me. It's the fear of the unknown that's stopping me being free of it. Well, um, yeah, there are, but there also might be some some good reason to be cautious and to be slow and maybe it's not the right timing for you i mean this is one of the reasons that we talk about going slowly and having a gradual reduction and sometimes transitioning to a liquid form or getting different size tablets that you're taking so that you can you know if you're if you're really afraid you know you can start with a five percent reduction you can start with a very very small um, reduction just get the process going sometimes people will feel a very small reduction in their dosage just because it's, there's a huge psychological threshold to go from the doctor, the doctor's recommended dosage to something lower. Like that's a big step for people when they've been on a drug for many years. So I think that in a situation like you're describing, just getting started is going to be a big step. So think about just a very small reduction and the kinds of preparations you might need in terms of a liquid formulation or in terms of smaller tablets. To do that, and then you know, if you have the with some withdrawal effects, then find other ways to work with them. And one of the things that we say a lot in withdrawal is that time tends to be on your side. If you can just hang in there, then often your your brain will make adjustments, and your life, and your body, and your mind will make adjustments and get you um, through the withdrawal um, discomfort phase. And then once things have settled down a bit, then you continue on with another reduction. Thank you. That is reassuring. And again, being open about this, this podcast is helping me personally to prepare for a time when I feel I have sufficient confidence to withdraw properly. That's great. Yeah, that's that's really great. And also just, you know, really honor your own intuition. You know, maybe it's fear and maybe it's also just, hey, this isn't quite the right time for me yet. I'm still preparing. I'm doing this podcast. I'm doing some other preparations. And when the time is right, you know, you'll have a feeling in your gut. You'll have a a sense that, okay, now is when I'm going to get started with this. So again, it's like that harm reduction approach that doesn't see it as a one way, one size fits all for everyone, but it's really respects where people are at with it. Will, you've been fantastic to chat with today. And thank you on behalf of all the listeners for all of your work to help and support others and to raise awareness of these issues, which can really easily become isolating. To know that there are many routes to good health and well-being is so important. You're one of the leading lights of this movement, and that deserves huge respect and gratitude. Well, thank you, James. It's really great to be on on the show, and I'm uh, wishing you the best with the podcast. Man, I really believe in this project. We need more information like this, and podcasts are a great way to reach people, so I'm really glad you're, you're doing this. I'm so grateful to Will for talking with me. It was an honor to be able to speak to someone with such vast knowledge and experience in this area. As a reminder, Will's book, Outside Mental Health, Voices and Visions of Madness, is available now and is excellent reading for people, whether you have experience of mental health care or not. Also, listen in to Madness Radio. It's an excellent source of information that's presented in a non-judgmental, open-minded way. You can find it on iTunes by searching for Madness Radio. Will also has a personal website located at willhall.net. 
Madden America News and Updates. On Madden America this week, in blogs, Sarah David Hour writes about the increasing awareness of the Hearing Voices movement, noting that there are something like 100 Hearing Voices groups now peppered across the United States. She also notes that the Hearing Voices movement is up against a lot in this culture where there is so little tolerance for uncertainty and exploration. She tells us that the World Hearing Voices Congress will be held at Boston University, Boston, Massachusetts, August the 16th to the 18th, and will include topics on open dialogue, hearing voices support for children, creating access for people of colour, hearing voices support in prisons and other locked settings, online groups, withdrawing from psychiatric drugs, family supports, creative writing, music and much more. In news this week, Bernalyn Ruiz talks about a large study which confirms an elevated risk of diabetes for the users of antipsychotic drugs. Bernalyn tells us about a large longitudinal cohort study out of Denmark, recently published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, which corroborates previous evidence that antipsychotics increase the risk of developing diabetes in people diagnosed with schizophrenia. Numerous medications have been associated with elevated risk of diabetes. Antidepressants, for example, are understood to reduce pancreatic insulin secretion, which is believed to increase the risk of developing diabetes. This elevated risk has also been demonstrated in children and youth exposed to antipsychotics. For this study, more than 2.7 million people were followed, which represented more than 49.5 million person years. This large nationwide study confirmed endogenous risk for diabetes among individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, with risks increasing significantly when antipsychotics are prescribed. Moreover, the threefold risk identified in this study matches the threefold elevated risk found in children and youth exposed to antipsychotics. For more on these and other items, visit maddenamerica.com. Thank you so much for listening today, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.